age of 25 may be saying, that sounds familiar. Those of you who are older may say, I, I know that tune. How many of you have a face that comes to mind when you hear that tune? Anybody on that, right? Whose face comes to your mind when you hear Bruce? Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. Right. We're looking at the book of Clint Eastwood this morning. <laughs> As I was preparing my sermon this week, that, that tune. Da, da, da. I was, if they played a little longer, I would have gotten to be able to do that part. Hey, ho, ho. You know, in the middle of the, those of you who know, know the song really well. Some of you are thinking, what in the world is, you know, but that title came to mind and I Googled it, the movie, and I saw it has, an, the original title, title was in Italian, and it just looked so cool. I decided to put an Italian title on my sermon this morning, right? Because it looks so much neater to be able to say, right, il buono. Il brutto, il cavito, a cattivo, right? Capisce? You get, you know, you get, you understand, right? So, what do those words mean? The good, the bad, and the ugly, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. It was a movie that was made in 1966. Those spaghetti westerns, right? Because they were kind of westerns in Texas, Mexico, whatever, the California but by the Italian director, right? And um, I still love to just watch them, flick them on. It just, you know, some, somehow they take me back and I'm on, you know, I'm a kid again, even though I, I, I don't really, you know, just, just because of this, the era, right? Well, the movie was set in Civil War time and the good, the bad, and the ugly were three different characters. And while Clint Eastwood is the good, he's really still an outlaw, Right? It, 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 it's hard to... Clint Eastwood's character's name in the movie is Blondie. And that just doesn't fit him, typically, right? But that's his name in the movie. He is Blondie. There's a lot of great lines in there. It's set in the Civil War time. and But these three guys are out to just make some, you know, some money. And they're tough, rugged characters. And they've got all sorts of those gritty, you know, one-liners, you know, uh, in the movie... But in one of the lines that stands out to me, Tuco, who is one of the bad guys as well, he's, uh, he sees the soldiers coming. Of course, he thinks they're Confederate because their uniforms look gray, but really they're Union soldiers. They just have a lot of dust on their uniforms. He doesn't know that. But, but he sees them and he goes, Hooray! Hooray for the Confederacy! You know, God is with us because he hates the Yanks. And Blondie says, God is not on our side because he hates idiots also, right? <laughs> and and it's, a, it's, it's a great line it, to, to me fitting into this sermon, right? How does he fit this movie into the book of James? It's a, he, he's got to get in trouble for that when he gets into heaven. I don't know. But, 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 but because, you know, Blondie, what is Blondie saying? He's saying, look... The results that we're going to face don't determine whether God's good or for us or not. We're going to get what we deserve because we've chosen the course that we're in here, right? We've chosen the path that, that, that we have uh, stepped into. And, you know, it, we are well aware that what we're going to get is the result of ourselves, Blondie knows that his actions are bringing consequences. What they got themselves into. I invite you to open up, if you haven't already, to the book of James in the New Testament because we began studying it a few weeks ago. And we said in the beginning, James is very practical. One writer says he's dropping different pearls into our mind, right? He's so very practical. And he's going to get into practical real life here. James is going to be very honest with us. He has been. He said, look, I, 
When he began, he said, I know some of you feel like, why would God let us go through trials? And he talked about all what God can be doing through trials and the treasure of getting to know God better. And he jumped practically last week into saying, look, and, and I see so many people who think they're more important because they have more money than these people who don't. And, and don't measure yourself by that. And he just continues dropping practical aspects. And he says, look, one of the things that I see is I see people who fall into the temptation, people being all of us, this daily struggle we can have when we are facing the results or whatever of temptation that we've gotten into to want to, to wanna get angry and blame God. Shouldn't he be able to control everything? And James is graciously going to set us straight in this area. And so let's ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. Father, I thank you for the gift of your living word, the Bible today. Speak to us, Lord, in a practical way. Only you know the hidden parts of my heart, and you know the hidden parts of everyone here. You know you know, the sidetracks we take, the struggles we have, the, uh, the places that we are pulled toward. We ask you to speak to us today, individually, in the name of Jesus. Amen. In James chapter 1, we read in verse 12, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. James is dealing with a specific problem. Now, th- there are different uses of the word. It's the same word, but we can read about trials and temptations, and in some ways, God is using them in the same way. But, but James does make a, 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 a divide here that there are trials in life that God allows to come our way, and he's using them to mold us, to draw us closer to him, to develop a deeper character in us. But, but, but temptations are different. He's going to say to us, when, when you are facing temptation towards sin, And it may be in the trial. You may say, uh, I've been hurting so bad that I'm tempted to turn away from God. God is not tempting you to turn away from Him. That temptation is coming from somewhere else, James is saying to us. But that's the issue James is going to jump right into. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. I was reading a, in a uh, ministry magazine, a pastor was sharing a real life incident that he dealt with. There was a particular uh, woman that had been invited to his church and she was a bright and vibrant and lovely lady and she came, she, she came to Christ. You know, she it, it, through through the, the ministry there, she gave her heart to Jesus, became a, uh, a a new creature in Christ, and her husband wanted nothing to do with that whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, her now coming to Christ kind of caused a little bit of a, you know you know he he began to even like you know make fun of her for it, try and agitate her more, try to find ways to be able to say, see you you say you're a Christian that that, that kind of thing. And he also was going deeper and deeper into a uh, a frustrating cycle of alcoholism. So she went to a Christian counselor. She decided, you know, I'm going to go to a counselor to how, how does God want me to deal with this? And as she went into that counselor, her first visit was very encouraging, very heartwarming as that counselor, he comforted her and cared for her. And in the next session, he 
began to tell her how her husband didn't deserve her and how wonderful she was and how super she was and she loved to hear that and in the next session she you know perhaps made her you know made herself a, just even a little bit more uh, appealing and into the, and before you knew it in this counseling session they uh, entered into an extended affair which then resulted with the counselor breaking it off with her and her eventually coming to the pastor crushed and broken and bitter and angry. And what the pastor shares in in this article was, what was fascinating was her bitterness and her rage and her anger was not directed toward this counselor who took advantage of her, her broken heart and her vulnerability. It wasn't directed at herself for what she chose to allow herself to go into. It was directed at God. She said, I asked God to send me to a counselor, and that's the counselor He sent me to. It's His fault. It's God's fault that that happened. I can sit here and find myself saying, how can you blame God when you know it was you and the other man? And... But I realize her excuse she got from her father. And I don't mean her immediate father. I mean her earthly father that is also my earthly father. And your earthly father. I mean Adam. Because if you look all the way back, uh, hold your place in James. And I know you, you may know the verse. But look all the way back to the beginning of Scripture where God lets us know where we came from. On Sunday nights, we've been looking at the, the reliability of the Word of God. And one of the things we talked about was that, that for Scripture to be reliable, it has to be realistic. A biblical worldview has to make sense when we look around us, right? If Scripture said that God does not let bad things happen to good people, we would say, you know what? That doesn't fit with what I see around me, right? You know, scripture tells us who we are. It gives a clear explanation for what we're looking at around us. And it lets us know where our dad went when he was at fault. Because we all go back to Adam. We know that. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, after they have sinned against God and disobeyed Him, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, that is God, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And again, this is not the God of all creation saying, Wait a minute, did something happen that I don't know about? This is the God of all creation knowing his creatures and saying, I'm going to ask it in a way that makes you respond. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Verse 12, and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate it. Hey, (laughs) who are you looking at? Right? I, you told me to make her happy. To, you told me to be her help, you know, that she's my help meet and I'm supposed to care for her, you know, and, and, and isn't one of the languages of love to do, you know, whatever she tells me. To, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's Adam saying, it's not my fault. You don't understand. It's, it's, it's not my fault. As a matter of fact, If you look at the fingerprint evidence, it's your fault. You made her. You could have made her differently. In fact, you gave me a bad helpmate. I I have a faulty product here. She led me astray. It's your fault. And we look back at James. James is going to say to us, When you're in that state of mind, you need to stop and see things clearly. James is saying nobody is tempted by God to sin. We need to step back and see some things. We're we're seeing the roles wrong here. When my father 
came out of surgery, I got to, I was there when he came into the recovery area, the ICU, but he was not conscious at the time and on the respirator and all that. Uh, I wasn't there when he first woke up, first opened his eyes. Um, my brother Leo was there, my brother Dan and uh, his wife Nancy were there, and my mom was there. And they shared how he opened his eyes and kind of was just, and he's looking at them and his eyes are just wide open and he's, you know, he clear, obviously he's struggling with putting something together here. Now he was telling us later what he was experiencing. The night before his surgery, Dan called him on the phone because our owls were meeting on Thursday night. Our older, wiser, loving seniors, some of you were there at the owls meeting. So Dan was talking to him about it. And so that was in his mind, obviously. And so when his eyes first opened, he saw Dan there. And he said to us later, what I realized was happening, I'm, I'm looking at Dan and I realized we're, we're practicing a skit for the owls that we're going to be doing. And Dan is having us all do a part here. And Dan's doing his role. And, and he said, and as we're doing this skit and practicing it, he says, the thought that came into my mind was, I'm in so much pain right now. Whatever Dan is making me do, it hurts so bad He'd better be careful which owl he gives this role to in the skit because it might kill one of them, he says, right? So he's thinking, I be, you know, I, we better figure out who is going to get this role that I'm playing because I'm in agony, right? Obviously, he was not seeing things clearly, right? And we look and we say, look at all this, Lord God, you're the, your role was this. And, and James says, hey, see the right roles because there are different roles here. There's the good, there's the bad, and there's the ugly. The good, James makes clear right away, is God. The good is God. In, in their day, they were used to blaming the gods. The Greeks, the Romans. But because, it's because they're gods, if you, if you read about, you know, you know, the pagan gods, the Greeks, the Romans, they're like soap opera characters a lot of, you know, and they're, they're angry and, you know, or they're taunting and they're teasing and they're, you know. You know all, James is going to say, listen, I want you to see the true God. You have to see him clearly. If you don't have a clear view of him, you're going to be all over the map in how you think he feels about you at any given moment. James says, know this, the true God of all creation, get this settled in your mind. Look at verse 17. What is he like? He says this, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above. Listen, James says, everything, everything good in your life is a gift from God. Everything. There are times, and I don't know if you ever have these conversations, but there are times in our house where, you know, I w would get on that, that kind of that speech, right, with my children as they were younger and even as they've grown, right? And I'd be saying to them, listen, I want you to know every, do you realize every second you're in that shower, it's costing me water, and it's costing me gas because it has to be, what do you mean? I say, I'm saying you, your, your, your showers are too long, right? Every second in the shower is costing me more money. You need to realize that when you're washing your hair, just be going cha-ching, 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 you know, and, and know that. It costs money, right? Everything you turn on, right? When you, whether it's the TV or the, your light and you leave it on or the, anything, that, everything that's drawing power is costing money. Every time you open the refrigerator and go, ah, let's see, well, what do I want? It's costing money, right? Every time you hold the door open in the winter, you know, and it, it, you, know you know what I'm saying. We, get, we give those speeches, right? They're true. But it's a reminder that, hey, do you realize this is all coming from somewhere? Yet we forget 
God could give us the same speech. Far more beyond, right? That, that Take an honest look at God, James says. Everything in your life is a gift from Him. Oh, yeah. Some God He is. You see my TV? My TV is like, you know, not, I, don't, I don't have any HD stuff here. It is old beat up TV, kind of like a blurry screen. Oh, how do you know that it's a blurry screen? Well, look at it. Oh, you mean you have the gift of sight to see the blurry screen, right? Yeah, I got, you, know, I, you know, the sound on this thing is terrible, you know what I mean? I got no surround sound. How do you know you don't have surround sound? Well, just listen, I can hear it. Oh, you have the gift of hearing? You see, everything that we complain about usually comes out of a gift, out of a blessing. You know, yeah, why didn't, you know, my child, you know, my child, you know, they, they never got to be a star on their sports team. You know what I mean? Everybody else is getting the awards. And, oh, you mean you have a child who can run around the field and actively be involved in it? You know, it's a gift, right? It, it, the, every gift, every good thing is a gift from God. Every sip of water, every warm breeze, every breath of air, every smile that you see, every bit of it is a gift from God. Every bit of it is a gift from God. Who what? James says in verse 17, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. He doesn't change. And you need to understand that. So when you're over here saying, wow, God is so good. Oh, we had a wonderful vacation and God gave us good weather and we just had a beautiful time. Oh, he's so good. And you're over here saying, Lord, where are you? You realize realize what I'm going through? He's the same God, right? He's the same God and he is always being good. No shifting shadow. They they understood that more because they were so tuned into right shadows and time and I remember when I first when I first started working for my father in law, we were driving somewhere on a business trip years ago, 1980, was 80, I don't know, 85. We were driving on a business trip and I'm coming up to a, a you know a road that you know you can go left or right and and he knows where we're going and I said okay which way do I turn and he goes go west, west. Left or right, right? What do you mean go west? There's there's no signs that say west, east. Left or I said, well, left or right? And he said, west. And I'm saying, okay, gee, Dad, okay, uh, which way is west, right? You know, and I'm not making fun of Greta's father. He grew up on a farm, okay? And he he shared, I I grew up on a farm, and you know, we all you watch the sun, east, west, and you could tell by the shadows what time it was and what you need to do where the shadows are by the all right, I grew up in Maple Shade, you know. You make a left or a right on Mill Road, you know, I don't know east, west, you know, I don't know, which, which way do I go, right? But th- th- he says to them that that's our God. He's good. And there's never a shifting in his shadow. You're never getting 90% of it. He's good. He's good. But his greatest gift, what does James say? Above all the things that he's done, verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. James says, listen, remember this and get this. Before I even talk about the, those, the, you know, your frustration and those temptations, settle this issue in your mind. If you deserve to suffer in hell forever for your sin, and I do. I do. I deserve to suffer in hell forever for my sin. I need to accept that, because that's what I deserve. I have sinned against Almighty God. James says, if that's what you deserve, and he took all of your sin, and he put it on Jesus, and Jesus paid for it, through his suffering on the cross. And God, totally as an act of his own gracious will, not because you deserve it, 
Not because you earned it. God forgives all of your sin on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for you through faith and gives you eternal life with Him in heaven. If you went from there to there, that better settle it for you that God is good to you. God is good to you. What an ultimate gift. God is good and God is good to me. And so he applies that to temptation. For he says in verse 13, Therefore let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. You cannot say God made me sin. It's God's fault because He directed that temptation. God, that cannot come from God. God is not tempted by sin in any way. He he doesn't sit there and, oh, I better not, right? That's not God. I, I, I think I may have shared it a while ago. I, I, I feel like I remember sharing it. One of, the, one of the early dates I had with Greta, we went to a little Italian place. It was more of a you know, pizza shop or whatever they, on Route 70 out by uh, 541. It's, I don't think it was there anymore. It was you know, kind of a strip stores. And, and um, we were, uh, I was trying to impress her, obviously. And so she said, you want to get an appetizer? And certainly. Because an appetizer is fried mozzarella, right? Or potato skins with bacon and cheese, right? And she said, oh, how about these artichokes stuffed with mushroom? Excuse me, artichokes stuffed with crab meat. Oh, yeah, that's great. (laughs) Sure. And I remember them coming out and taking one of them. And I remember just... and, And my instant thought was... Is this girl worth me not spitting this out right now on the table? You know, do I just spit it out and say, all right, you want me to take you home? Like, like, what, what? And so I just kind of held it a little, a little bit, but just at a point I kind of grabbed the napkin and I, I, I kind of, I said, is that the way they're supposed to taste, right? Is that, is that, and she, well, these aren't the best ones I ever had, you know, and I, and I can tell you this, you put artichokes in front of me, stuffed with crab meat, and I haven't eaten for a week, mate, I don't know, I, 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 that, that, I, I'm still, well, it's all right, you know. There was, I, I saw some grass outside before we came in here, you know what I mean? Like that was, you could wrap it in peanut butter, you could put double layer of chocolate around it, I'm, it just, it, I'm just, I, maybe I'll lick the chocolate off, you know what I mean? But, but, but no, what I mean is, you know what I'm saying, and we're all different. I remember, you know, Joe Michael, Joe McMichael, I love Joe, and he's with the Lord, and we were talking once about him saying, oh, how hard it is for me to lose weight, and I'm saying, you know, well, Joe, I'm saying, you know, you know, you know, how do you not eat bread and pasta, right? You love bread, don't you? No, I could take it or leave it. I said, what about pasta? Yeah, I don't need it. I said, well, that's not fair, right? Because... I, no wonder, I love bread and pasta, right? How is that? But we're tempted by different things. But God is not tempted by sin. It's the truth. So whether you want to argue with Him doesn't matter. Because it's the truth. And James says, and I spent a lot more time on the good, believe me, than on the bad and the ugly. We're, 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 we're near the end. James says God is good. Sin doesn't tempt God, but it does tempt us. And that's the bad we actually see there in verse 14. He says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. The picture there is, you know, of kind of luring an animal or, or uh, you know, a fish or whatever into a trap, right? It is is lured and carried away and enticed and I'm by no means a great fisherman and I went fishing with a friend of mine this uh, you know within the last year up at Lake Cayuca in in New York 
uh, Jeff Prentice's family has a, a little ha- a house up there, and, and we went out at nighttime, and we were really going out at nighttime to catch the stuff to use to catch the, the big fish, and so we were after these saw bellies, as they're called, and so we just went out on the pitch black lake, and we took a big bright light, and we just shined the light on the water, and you just wait, and they just can't help it. Those saw bellies see the light, and they just come to it. Got to go to the light. Got to go, right? And I just sat there with that net. I was bringing in saw bellies, like, you know, I just scooping them up out of the water. That was the most successful fishing I've ever done. And I, I don't know if they're actually fish, you know what I mean? What, what they are, right? But, but it, it's, it's what we do. James says, it's us. We're the bad. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. It's the appetite to sin inside of me. And it's there. And it's there even as a believer, because Paul tells the Galatians, know this, as a Christian, your flesh is at war with the Spirit. And your flesh is trying to get you not to do what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Know it. Know it. It's your flesh. God gave it to me. No, it's your flesh. It's, it's my sin appetite. I remember years ago counseling a fellow and him literally looking at me and telling me why he has cheated on his wife so many times. And it is not his fault. He's saying, and he, pastor, you need to understand, God made me with an appetite for more than one woman. And it's like, I, I, you have to understand, Pastor, I just, I just need to be with, with several women, you know, have different relationships in my life all at one time. And I said, don't, don't, don't you dare blame our incredible God. That's you. That's your appetite to sin. Now, we may be affected and shaped. Don't misunderstand me. You know, if, 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 if you were exposed to a certain uh, type of sin as a child and it may have shaped you, and, but, but, but James says, listen, don't you tell God, hey, it's your fault. It's us. It's us. And we know what happens. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I don't know if you've heard references to him before. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor during Hitler's reign in Germany. Dietrich Bonhoeffer opposed Hitler, spoke against Hitler's persecution of the Jews. Eventually, Bonhoeffer was arrested and he was hung to death in a concentration camp. But before that, he says this about his own life, his own heart. He says, with irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. It makes no difference whether it's Sexual desire, ambition, vanity, desire for revenge, or love of fame and power, or greed for money. Joy in God is extinguished in us, and we seek all our joy in the creature. At that moment of temptation, God is quite unreal to us. He loses all reality, and only desire for the creature is real. Satan does not here fill us with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. James says, when we're falling into sin, don't blame God. Lord, you could have kept me out of this. Know that it's coming from within us. And we're being lured astray and and know where it's going to lead you. Because the bad leads to the ugly. Because he says there in verse 15, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Jesus compares, excuse me, James compares the desire to sin and follow it to conception and what what it will lead to a child. Right? Conception leading toward birth, right? And, and, and he says, when you choose that path towards sin, no, it is leading to death. 
And we can look all around our world and see lives that are evidence of it, right? An individual is miserable and they're having a lousy day or they're not happy or they're grieving or whatever and so I don't want to have to feel this anymore and so I'm just going to go get trashed. And they get themselves so intoxicated and they come out of there and they hop in their car because nobody has a right to tell me what to do and they turn that car on and they head off down that highway and they collide head on with that individual and death comes out of it and we say God why did you let that happen now don't misunderstand what I'm saying here I'm not talking about a God who's powerless who just says look you're on your own he is sovereign and absolutely God can intercede and prevent pain and God God allows these events to occur but the point is this God did not make that man choose to follow sin that led into death. We see the good, we see the bad, and we see the ugly. And I want you to know, when I'm uh, preaching this sermon, James here, you know, as James writes it and as I preach it, I'm not preaching this, there was no effort in my heart this, this week to, to hope that I do a really good job defending God. Right? I'm not going to get to heaven someday. God's not, I mean, I'm going to get to heaven by the grace of God, but I'm, God's not going to meet me there and say, hey, Vince, thanks a lot for that message on February 17th because people were being so unfair to me. I just felt like they were, they were, they were misjudging me and mistreating me and, and, and nobody was sticking up and you stuck up for me. Thank you. You know, that's obviously not going to happen. Our God is not sitting there ever feeling like, why is everybody blaming me? God is... Sovereign and secure and holy. The sermon's not for him. It's for us. It's for me. That I follow sin into destruction. The amazing, the amazing truth is that we really can end with, with another word, right? Right? Il buono, il brutto, il cattivo, il incredibile, however you say it in, in Italian, right? It's incredible. The good, the bad, the ugly, and the incredible. That God says to us, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The good God, the bad, the ugly that we let ourselves muck around in, right? The incredible God who forgives us and says, now, get out of that. As we're told in Scripture, he, he, he takes us and makes us, gives us hinds feet on high places. Let me lift you up out of that to a better life. That's the good God we follow. Uh, whatever you've gotten yourself in, stop blaming Him. Turn to his goodness, for he will abundantly pardon. That's our God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. Oh, Lord, thank you. We ask, Lord, for each of us individually, wherever we are today, if we came in here battling you, blaming you, ignoring you, Lord, Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, out of ourselves. Out of the lusts within us that so easily entice us. Deliver us, Lord. Forgive us. 
Set us on a new course, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The closing song we're going to sing is not up on the... uh,